here in this room is a will. What would you do if you thought you knew the exact day World War III would break out? And who might start it, where it might be fought, and who might be left when it was over? Where would you go? How would you protect your family? Don't miss the incredible predictions of Nostradamus, the man who saw tomorrow from Warner Brothers, rated PG. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Mystery Vault podcast. I'm your host RJ McCready and for this episode it can be taking a look at the, uh, I guess you could say infamous, he's famous, uh, I'm going to say that a lot of you guys have heard of him and that's right, it is Nostradamus, the man who predicted the future or did he, uh, which is under lots of speculation Um it's an important one to the mystery world, I think, because uh, I'll just tell you from my perspective. Now, I grew up in the 80s, and if you've listened to my other show, Bite Size Cinema, um, you would have heard myself and my good friend and listener and fellow podcast host, uh, Dan Bone, talk about the 80s and when we grew up. And um, one of the conversations we had, and it was a great conversation, was how scared we were actual, actually in the 80s, because... Um, you had movies from the 70s like Earthquake with um, Charlton Heston, the airport disaster movies, uh, you had the Cold War, uh, there was this sense that there was going to be World War Three. that's how I felt when I was a kid because it was brought up a lot on movies, I think they even brought it up on films like Back to the Future when they're talking about like plutonium and things like that. Uh, you had the also had like the mystery books on the table as well. So as as a kid, there was these there was this thing of um, it also had quicksand as well. Uh, Dan would never forgive me if I didn't bring bring up quicksand, but that's like a little bit of an in joke that we have as well. Um, but I'm just trying to sort of build up that type of mentality that you had when I was a kid growing up. And Darren Randall, you listen to this as well. You might agree with me here. You're probably shouting at the microphone, but um, you've got. A, the way I want to try and produce, produce this show today, or tell you this story, how I see it, is the time that I, you know, that I grew up in, and more than likely, in fact, it wasn't more than likely. This was kind of like a fact. When I was at school um, in the playground, this was a subject that we used to talk about. We used to talk about Nostradamus, and you know, our parents had. You know, <laughs> read these books and told us these stories and said hey there's this guy that can predict the future and some of these predictions are quite scary and one of them was you know that we've always predicted world war three and disasters and things like that and that could be more terrifying than anything else than actual ghosts and sea monsters because this guy um not only was he predicting the future but the, the book that he had written had actually stated things that had already happened in the past, like uh, you know the French Revolution, uh, World War Two, the moon landing. So um, it was those predictions that kind of made you think, well, if he's put that down on paper and, and, and predicted that, then these stories or these predictions of the future, where he's talking about World War Three in particular, which kind of scared the hell out of me, uh, made you think, well, mate, well, maybe there's something to this. Um, so yeah, that's where I think that's important for me to tell you that because that's that's where I've come from and where I've brought up. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna put this straight down, guys. I'm not going to sit on the fence with this one either. Um, I, I think there is something to this as well. Um, and I'll explain why now. And as always, guys, if you've listened to my other shows, always like try to look at the facts and the evidence and see things from a scientific point of view um, so I think this is quite an important one because I thought about this the other day when I was doing all the research um, so you've got this book The Prophecies which was written by Nostradamus in 1555 and he's he's put down these uh, quatrains which are like 
um, four lines. They're, they're written as a, as a as a poem. Now, I'll go into who to how he put these methods together. But the way I like to think about it when with stuff like this is. You got to think about your day-to-day -day things and the day-to-day -day phrases that we use. So there's the things like, uh, "Oh, just felt like someone's walked over my grave." You know, we have that sense. A lot of people talk about the sixth sense of that. Oh, again, I've heard this many a times where you know you've gone to work and someone's gone, "God, I've just got this funny feeling today. Don't know what it is. Just you know, woken up and just got this sixth sense about something." And the other one which I like as well, and some of you may or may not agree with me, but I've heard this in conversation, is you're walking down the road and then you're just thinking about someone you haven't seen for a long time and all of a sudden that person turns up. And then on top of that you've got um, a full moon. When the full moon turns up people say, oh, oh no, it's a full moon. That means that people are going to go crazy or it affects people. Uh, the solar eclipse that has uh, has some sort of effect on us as well, as much as the uh, full moon. You also have the the seasons of the year: uh, autumn, winter, spring, summer. So you do have a type of cycle. So let's just use that for example. So you you know when spring, summer. That might be a little bit questionable right now, guys, with the way the weather is at the moment. But you, when you're in winter time and you talk about the summer during the summer time, you know it's possibly going to be really hot and sunny. And then when you get into the winter time, it's going to be really cold. And I think that the building platform I'm trying to get you in your mindset here is that we do have patterns. And patterns that we could probably agree on to say, yeah, we have seasons, so that is a pattern. And we have a, a time where it's warm, and a time where it's cold, and a time where the farmers put the you know seeds into the ground, and a time where they harvest. And going back to the astrology uh, time, there's that phrase as well when someone, you know, we've, I've said it again on, on shows when we talked about uh, movies in particular, we say, oh, you know, the planets have aligned for that one. And usually when the planets align, it's usually say, oh, something, something good is going to happen or something bad is going to happen. Um, and then going back to when you meet someone, it's uh, whether you guys agree or not, some of you <laughs> might agree with me where you, you've met someone you've gone, I've, I've never met this person before, but I feel like I've known them for years. You know, you hear that. It's just that sort of sense that you get. Or you meet someone and you think... <sighs> don't like that person, I don't know why, never met him before, but don't know what it is, just me and that person just not going to get on. And I think what, what I'm trying to say here guys is just trying to get you into that sort of mindset of that when you look into life generally and you just stop and sit back and you think there are actually patterns, there are cycles. And this is important to talking about this episode with Nostradamus. Now did he find a pattern which enabled him to predict the future and I think what he's done it's just one of my theories having a look at all the research is that history it is important here so if you look back in the history books only from 1555 when he was when he was alive and when he wrote the books is that he's probably looked back on history and gone there was a cycle there's a good possibility that throughout the ages let's just talk about uh, like the war on peace, there are wars that have happened in the past where people have like tried to take over certain parts of Europe, um, say like the uh, Attila, Attila the Hun and Alexander the Great and all the ancient worlds and the Greeks and the Romans. You could look at that and think, well, when when and using astrology, when the, when the stars were in this formation, this is when this battle happens, or there might have been plagues. And the way I the way I look into this as well is, it, it, did he find a pattern which is similar to how we can tell the the weather? So we we put the TV on or put our phones on. We have a quick check to go. Oh, what's the weather going to be like next week? Oh, it's going to be raining. Did Nostradamus manage to find a pattern similar to like the weather system to say, well, if if it's cloudy on this day, that means that it's possibly going to be raining or sunny the next week because if this is happening today then that's going to cause this happen to happen tomorrow so that's how i would look at it if you use a weather pattern 
is it likely that Nostradamus found a pattern that's similar to that, but to be able to tell the future? So that just so another thing I'll put in there just to try and get your mind set to possibly how he was thinking. The other thing as well is a lot of the um, major events that happened, like the French Revolution and World War Two and 9-11, which was a bit of a hot topic, these events happened. And I think the other thing people say about his quatrains, his verses from, from the book, was did he also develop a poem that you could use as, let's just say, a template? So uh, she give you an example. So World War II has happened, and then someone's gone... Let's have a quick look at Nostradamus's book, and let's have a look at one of the quatrains. And there was 942 in there all together in this famous book that he produced. And you open it up, and what people are saying is, is that out of the 942 quatrains, is is there going to be a verse in there which will tie up to that event? And in 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 this case with World War Two, it was someone found you know the word hister. Uh, which is in one of the, one of the quatrains. You're going, hang on a second, Hester, Hitler, uh, that ties up with that. So I think what people, what, what um, you know, scientists, um, historians are, are, are saying when they look into Nostradamus is that is it just the fact that you the events happened and you pick up Nostradamus's book and you, there's a good chance that you're going to find something in there that will tie up. So is it something that he's done 942? Um, quatrains which will template every possible um, event that would happen in the future and you just go back and go yep yeah, there's a good chance that that will tie up with that so that's another one of the one of, one of the theories so people are saying is it just that the fact that he's written this book and it covers all possibilities of events and there's a good chance that you can tie it up or or did Nostradam was Nostradamus onto something you know did he could he foresee the future so um hopefully that's a little bit of a building block get guys there just trying to get your mind thinking and i think this is the thing with nostradamus is I mean, certainly with myself i've been looking into this for the last week and it's really opened up my mind almost blown my mind a little bit when you start looking into it um so there's a little bit of a building block there i'll get back into uh, I'll step back into this uh, in a minute, but what I'll do is I'll just uh, turn the clock back and let's just talk about Nostradamus and where he's come from and grown up. So, his full name is Michael de Nostradam, and he would later uh, Latinize his name as Nostradamus. He was born in France in 1503 and he died in 1566. So, he was a French astrologer, physician, and a reputed seer. And as I've mentioned already, he's best known for his book, The Prophecies, which was published in 1555. And it contained 942 predictions, which were the quatrains, as I've mentioned already, which contained four lines of um, almost like rhymes, uh, kind of like riddles, where he used a mixture of uh, French, Greek and Latin. And there's a reason why he... He mixed it up a little bit, but I'll get into that in a minute. Um, but since his death, uh, people have credited him for accurately predicting a future pivotal events such as the Great Fire of London, the French Revolution, World War Two, 9-11, even the coronavirus, uh, the end of the world, which he said that would happen in 3797. He is one of nine children who came from a Catholic family from the south of France. Uh, there's little known about his childhood, it's just um, evidence indicates he was very intelligent and he was taught Latin, Greek and Hebrew and mathematics, mainly by his grandfather. And he was also like taught Jewish traditions, uh, science, astrology and at the age of 14 he entered the University of Avignon but during this time there was a bubonic plague uh, which he helped out with and this is this created his interest for using herbs and chemistry and alchemy and stuff like that and after the outbreak of the plague it caused him to it, it cut short his time at the university so what he did was he traveled to south of france to learn herbal medicine so he was just a guy on the road helping people out and then in 1522 he entered the university of montpellier 
He studied to become a physician, but during this time he always had a little bit of a fallout with the, uh, the Catholic priest who disagreed with his astrology methods, and he almost got banished from the university because he was still using his herbal medicine, um, his chemistry, because that was treated as a, a trade, something that you actually needed to have a license for back then. Um, but this is also one of those things, looking at the evidence, where some people say he did get in trouble and other people say he didn't get in trouble and some say that the Catholic priest actually um, agreed with these methods. But um, I think this little attention to detail with stuff like that just goes to show that Nostradamus was a guy that fought outside the box. So he wasn't a guy that was sort of rolling along with the system, but then his methods with medicine, I think one of the reasons why he was so passionate about that is because he had treated plague victims and obviously today medicine is a big important an important thing and it's something that would later make him a celebrity but having said that in 1525 he eventually received a li license to practice which he then used um, over the next several years to travel through France he liked to travel um, he went through France and Italy and he treated uh, victims of the plague and with his herbal medicine um, along with that, he also practiced uh, hygiene as well. He said that if you've got the plague, the best thing to do is just you know separate yourself, get some fresh air, uh, wash yourself down. Hy hygiene's very important. And he also came up with uh, rose hip lozenges, which are very rich in vitamin C to help with the plague victims. So he's very advanced in his techniques. And because of these techniques, as I just said, this made him a local celebrity. So Nostradamus started to become a name. He then married. Uh, he had two children. And, but unfortunately, um, there was another outbreak of the plague. There was a lot of plague back then. And it's something that, you know, unfortunately us guys, you know, today we can, can relate to now. Um, his wife and his two children, unfortunately, got um, died through the plague. He survived. And so after this, he, he spent another few years travelling, trying to help uh, plague victims. And this is where people say in the history books is where, because he had this tragedy in his life, it's where he had a psychic awakening. Which now leads on to one of his first predictions. So uh, legend says that Whilst he was in Italy, he came across a group of monks and he identified one of the monks as the future Pope who was ordained in 1585. And when he met this uh, monk, he, he kneeled down and he said, Your Holiness. And then he walked away and then later on this, this monk would become a Pope. So was he having a vision of the future? So there you go. This is where he's had this uh, psychic awakening. And like I say, history says that this event happened. In 1547, he then remarried and he settled down in France and he had six children. This is where he, had, he released two books on medical science. And after settling down, he became settled, he started to move from science into the occult. And this is where they historians say that he would spend many hours meditating in front of a bowl filled with water and herbs. And then this would follow on for him to then write almanacs of astrological, astrological uh, put my teeth back in, information of predictions of the coming year. He did this in 1550. And these were our almanacs, and apparently he created 6,000 predictions. The almanacs also contained information about um, what was happening with the farmers. So, as I mentioned earlier, you had like the. Uh, times of harvest and, and the cycles of, you know, when the farmers would put seed into the ground and when the crops would grow. So he was recording all of this and putting it into yearly al almanacs. And he's becoming very popular. And again, with his predictions, it was kind of, you know, do, do you believe it or not? Some people believed, some people thought that he was a fraud. Um, some of the, as I said, like the, the Catholic, Catholic priest and other certified uh, medical practitioners back back then, they were uh, challenging his methods. But again, when when I'm talking about his methods, going back to him staring into that uh, 
bowl of water with the herbs. Nostradamus was saying that he was using methods from ancient Babylonian times and the Greeks and the astrology and then staring into this bowl but he wouldn't tell he, there's a there's a method that he wouldn't tell either he, he wouldn't give it away so he kept that a secret and then by 1554 he decided to channel all of his energy into his massive opus which was called the centuries and then this is where he wrote the the famous book which has probably sold thousands of copy around copies around the world in different languages uh, the the prophecy which would forecast 2,000 years of 100 predictions with the uh, with the quatrains as I've mentioned already. So this is the famous book where he's made all these um, predictions about pivotal events in the future. But as I mentioned earlier, so he was very conscious that he was going to be persecuted by by religion at that time. So what he did was, was he devised a method to obscure these prophecies and that's the reason why he used the quatrains which were four lined rhymed verses which were mixed with Greek, Latin and French and the reason why a lot of people say you can't really understand these quatrains, they seem like riddles, he did that for a reason apparently what he said is that if I told you exactly what was going to happen it would either really scare you or I would be criticised by religion and other physicians and so far people at that time so just to sort of cover himself he's he just put a little bit of a blanket cover over these rhymes so they, he's giving a little bit away but he's not telling you the whole of it so he's mixing it up with a little bit of Latin and Greek and French so it's a little bit of a it, it, it is what it says, you know, it's like a riddle, you need to work it out. But at the same time, as I, as I mentioned earlier on in the episode, was it just his clever way of being able to, uh, the you know, create these quatrains so they would fit a template, as I've already mentioned, so it goes back to that. Um, but it did also so even though he was vulnerable to religious persecution, he also had a good relationship with the church. Um because I'll just sort of touch on the, the religious aspect here. Apparently the, the the Catholic Church was open to the two predictions and prophecies. But I'll only just sort of touch on that. But apparently that's how it was. So they so some people were agreeing with his methods. But having said that, even though the church was on his side, some, some members of the public were also a little bit curious about Nostradamus as well, thinking, hey, this guy's predicting the future. Could he be working for the devil? So some people were quite scared of him at the same time. He's very lucky that he wasn't getting bumped off. Uh, you know, as we know, you know, with with what's happened with witches and, you know, people getting burned at the stakes, which is part of our history, which did happen. Um, but in his case, no, he was lucky that that didn't happen to Nostradamus. So this now leads, this, now this is leading on to one of the first famous predictions. So uh, Nostradamus was becoming a celebrity, he had released this um, book and it's created a little bit of attention from King Henry II's wife, uh, Catherine de Medici. I think that's how you pronounce her name. I'm, I'm terrible at pronouncing names, guys. Um, she drew some interest, she she was a big fan of Nostradamus, she liked what he was doing with the predictions and she um, basically hired him to come like the king's council and physician, which was great. And she asked him if he, if he could create some horoscopes for the children. But Nostradamus never hold, held back, you know, bearing in mind that he's working for now the the king and his wife. He wasn't holding back at all. He actually came out and said, look, I'm, I will tell you the truth. I'll tell you the good predictions and I'll also tell you the bad ones as well. And one of those was that he said, I, I'm warning the king not to do any jousting. And three years later, this prediction came true. So I'll go into this prediction. I won't go into every single one of them, but I'll use, I will go into the more famous ones. 
So let's read out the quad train. So it says, The young lion will overcome the older one on the field of combat in a single battle. He will pierce his eye through a golden cage. Two wounds made one. Then he dies a cruel death. So after warning the king three years later, um, summer of 1559, King Henry took part in a jousting tournament in celebration of two royal weddings. And then in the third match, he took on the captain of the Scottish Guard, Gabriel Montgomery. Gabriel struck Henry and the joust split and fragments flew into Henry's vines and he died 10 days later. And so what's uh, strange about this case is Nostradamus already made this prediction to the king's wife. Well, the king himself, he warned him. And then what's spooky about this is that in this quad train, actually, he says, you know, the young lion will overcome the older one on a field of combat, being which you could say is a jousting tournament. And then what's strange here is it says that he'll pierce his eye, and it's where the joust is, you know, split, it's gone into his eye, and then two wounds made one. So they say he's got been hit in the eye, and then it's caused. I think it was like an abscess or something like that in his brain. I think he died of a brain hemorrhage, which um, I'm sure, you know, that's not even going to question this. It was probably bloody awful back in those times. So he then died 10 days later. So when you look at that quatrain, it does, does actually tie up. So following on from this, uh, one of Nostradamus' predictions came true in his time. As a, I'll sort of give that as an example. Um, he then later suffered from gout for most of his um, adult life. And then in 1566, he died from heart failure. Now, this is where it gets a little bit strange. Before his death, he is believed to have told his secretary that you will not find me alive at sunrise. And then the next day, he died. So it's like he predicted his own death. And then on top of that, and now I believe there's a little bit, did this happen or not, but let's just say apparently he also predicted that three sceptics during the French Revolution in High Revolution in May 1791. So this is like 200 years with Nostradamus buried undisturbed. Um, he foretold that he would be dug up and... The person that would dug, dig him up would drink from his skull and there was a local legend with this that if you dig, dig, dug up Nostradamus and drunk from his skull then you would obtain his power of uh, being able to foretell this future. Uh, now three sceptics did this in, on May 1791. Apparently one of them drank from the skull to inherit his powers but then he got shot and now Nostradamus predicted this saying if the person does this they'll also die and apparently he got a ricochet from one of the uh, rifles from a nearby battle but then the spooky thing here is, is that there was a plaque in the coffin saying 1791 so <laughs> make of that what you will this is all stuff that I've I've researched um, and I think there was a little bit of did it happen or did it not happen but Apparently Nostradamus predicted this and this event this event happened, which, you know, not only did he say, look, this is where I'm going to die, he also said someone's going to dig me up and this is going to happen. So <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it, it's mysterious, it's strange, but it, this is what I'm saying, guys. When you're talking about Nostradamus, it leads you down all avenues and gets you thinking. And then from the time of his death, he left the legacy with the prophecies, uh, this famous book, which is apparently predicted the future, as I've mentioned, you know, with events like, such as Napoleon and Hitler, the Toy Bomb and JFK. Uh, now, one of the final events I'm going to talk about here is the, it's quite a big one of our time, um, which is September 11th, 2001. Now, what is strange about this event, and this one's kind of like a personal one for me, which I will explain, um, is when I, when it goes back to me, to me being, you know, a kid in the 80s in the playground, this was the one that we spoke about because we were all terrified that World War Three was going to happen. And I seem to remember the verse that which I will... Um, in fact, what I'll do is I will just play a clip here and this is from a uh, 
uh, I think it was a TV documentary of Orson Welles. It was the man who could see tomorrow. I'll just play you a little clip. In the year 1999 and seven months, from the sky will come the great king of terror. He will bring back to life the king of the Mongols. Before and after war reigns. Out of the country of Greater Arabia shall be born a strong master of Mohammedan law. This king will enter Europe wearing a blue turban. He is one that shall cause the infernal gods of Hannibal to live again. He will be the terror of mankind, never more horror. Warfare on a greater scale than ever before. Explosions. There will be a great onslaught. There will be terror, terror, terror. Garden of the world, the new city in the way of the man-made mountains, shall be seized on and plunged into ferment. Again, Nostradamus suggests that New York, with its skyscrapers, its man-made mountains, will be a nuclear target. Nothing, the prophet says, will keep the city from dying. Hidden fires, a great place burns with heat. A hot wind, war. The great city will soon be quite deserted. Not a single one of the inhabitants will remain. So there you go, guys. You could, as you can hear, it's quite. It's, it, it actually terrified me watching that. Um, it was Orson Welles. He did a, uh, a TV, I think it was a documentary movie. Now, what's interesting here is, as I said, this 9-11 event, spoke about it in the pro playground back in the 80s. We thought it was going to be like World War Three was going to happen. And from that verse, it says in the year 1999, and what's interesting is in 1981, from the man who could see the future, they actually said that it would be someone from the Middle East, it'd be terror from the sky, um, it would burn at 45, 45 degrees and it'd be like the great new, new city. Now then, this is what got me thinking. Um, when I researched the 9-11 event, there was a lot of people after the event who turned to the Book of Nostradamus and it actually went through the roof and it was like a massive sale. And again, as I've explained, and I do get this, is that people have said, okay, the event has happened, 9-11 has happened, it's easy for you to now pick up the prophecy book and find something in there that will relate to that. And funny enough, it has. And the quad train, I think it's... Quatrain 72, I should have researched that, but um, it does say about, you know, the terror from the sky and 45 degrees and the new city. And some people say that it was a little bit doctored after the event. Some people said, you know, they've sort of said about the, you know, the twin towers, the two brothers. And there was also mention of, pe you know, after the event, people saying, well, you know, it's, it's easy to be able to sort of take the prophecies now after the event is over. But what I found interesting is going back 20 years before that event in 1981. This what, Just hear me out, guys. I watched that, The Man Who Could See Tomorrow, in 1981. Orson Welles actually used the quatrain for this um, documentary movie. And he actually said, you know, guy from the Middle East, and they actually mentioned New York. And when you check it out online, guys, it's on, I think it's on YouTube. Have a look at that clip, and they're actually like, it's very spooky how it relates to what actually happened. And they actually say, they actually use New York. Uh, the only difference is it's not obviously planes, but they say it's uh, nuclear missiles, so they thought it was going to be like a nuclear war. But even though I remember watching that and think, and I thought, I think they're onto something here. And when 9 11 happened for me, I just had this moment of, oh my God, this is it. This is what Nostradamus predicted. 
And this is what I said at the beginning, guys. You know, I won't sit on the fence. That's how I felt. I immediately thought um, this is Nostradamus' predictions. Even though he said 1999, it was pretty damn, pretty damn close. So, um, for me personally, I just thought uh, that's actually one of Nostradamus' predictions that I grew up with through the 80s and actually came into fruitation there or thereabouts, you know, in the sort of new, new millennium. It was quite scary. Um, but at the same time, what I will say is I appreciate how people might say, oh, you, you know, you can sort of debunk it. And that kind of goes back to the theories of people saying, you know, has Nostradamus created a template that you can use after the event has happened? And you'd be able to say, okay, that quad train fits in with that. Or, now this is the big question, one that we will never be able to sort of answer because unless you actually talk to Nostradamus himself if he's going to appear from somewhere you know he never really disclosed these methods of you know he didn't give us the full facts he gave us some of the facts and whoop, and this is the biggie this is the big question did he could he predict the future or not could he foresee the future and I think at the end of the day um, I think it's just a the way I think I'm just going to close is it's, it's personally down to you, you know. Um, it's fair to say that Nostradamus is out there, guys, and we all talk about him. So he has left this lasting legacy, and well, I think it's fair to say with Nostradamus, as soon as we have some major event in the world, say for example, with you know uh, the, the horrific thing that we've gone through in the world at the moment with COVID, because I know that's related. I haven't got into that, but I know people have touched on to that. <laughs> Is that when something like that happens? Because it's it, this goes on to 3,700 or whenever the world ends, as he as he predicts, um, that book will be taken off the shelf and people will be having a look. So um, it's it, it, I don't think it's something that we will necessarily get away from. So Nostradamus will be a household name <laughs> amongst us. So he certainly has left a, a legacy upon us. So. Um, there you go guys, um, I hope hope you enjoyed that, I hope that kind of makes sense and you know for, I'm sort of running on just over 30 minutes here, um, the way I, I design all my, all my episodes is so you can have a listen for half an hour and hopefully come away and go, yeah, I kind of get that, that kind of sort of all makes sense, so as a little bit of a roundup. So uh, the other thing I was going to say is there's an awful lot more on this subject, I've just sort of pretty much skimmed the surface really but go check it out have a look on google have a look at all all his other events which i no doubt some of you already have had, had a look at um there's a lot of stuff on there it's very in, it's a very very interesting subject so um that's it guys i'm going to close the show on that hope again like i say hope you enjoyed the episode um i will now go into a little bit of admin for the show as always i am a proud member of the legion podcast network so please go and check out all the other shows on there including my other show uh, bite science cinema which um the latest one i covered was uh pirates of the caribbean and uh, streets of fire so there's a whole catalog there for you to check out if you want to fancy having listened to that um now, let's talk about what I'm going to be coming back for now. I always like to dig up some unusual events as much as I like to talk about the sort of ones that we all know about. Uh, this one, next episode, is going to be about a meteor that hit in a place called Tunguska in Siberia in 1908 and it caused a massive shockwave around the world. So I thought I'd get into that. So um, talk about that episode. That'll be the one that will be dropping next. Um, you can also find the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, on several other players if you put in the Mystery Vault podcast onto Google. And I've also got a Facebook page where I'm most active. So yeah, drop any comments about this episode. If there's anything you wanted to tell me, anything, um, anything else you can add to this story, be happy to, yeah, let us know. Um, so yeah, that's it guys. So yeah. Keep looking to the future, guys. Keep it by... Oh, <laughs> I was almost going to say keep it by size, keep it safe. That's my other shape. Um, keep it mysterious. Keep it safe. And I'll see you soon. Because one of you, sitting here in this room, is a well.
If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcasts, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Mean Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Mental Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick Six Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which vs. The Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.